Happy October and welcome to Sect Ed. I'm Patrick Reynolds, and now that we're heading towards Halloween, uh, we thought we'd focus our next two episodes on two related sects that revel in darkness and the macabre, starting this week with the Church of Satan and following it up next episode with the Satanic Temple and the cultural phenomenon known as the Satanic Panic. So, to start off, we're going to be looking at one of the biggest figures in the development of modern Satanism, the founder of the Church of Satan, the Black Pope, Anton Zandor LaVey. As with our Discordian episode, there's going to be a lot of conspiracy theories, 60s counterculture ideas, and outright lies, but luckily with Anton LaVey, there's a slightly more clear and coherent story going on. So before we start jumping into our discussion on Satanism, just a couple announcements. Uh, first off, for those of you who follow us on social media, at SexEd, both at Facebook and Twitter, we are part of a social media campaign this month called Two Pods a Day. So if you search hashtag Two Pods a Day and follow that, basically every single day you're going to be given access to new independent podcasts from independent podcasters like us. Um, we're going to be featured at some point. We've uh, listened to and reviewed several great podcasts, so follow that hashtag, hashtag two pods a day for the month of October. So now before moving directly into a discussion of contemporary Satanism, we have to touch on the relationship between what is the popular Christian conception of Satanism compared to the sect that we are actually talking about. Before Anton LaVey in the 1960s, there really weren't any actual satanic sects, but there was a very long history of accusing people of worshipping Satan or being in league with him. So we're going to very briefly go over some of the roots and satanic imagery that LaVey would later use when creating his religion. So Satan as a figure in Christianity took a while to get going. The word Satan itself is more of a title than name, meaning obstructor or adversary, which was given to a number of different individuals in different books of the Bible, most notably the book of Job. Satan is also known within Christianity as Beelzebub, the devil, Lucifer, the serpent, and so on. But these different names came from a lot of different places and all have their own histories, often being the based off names of deities of other religions. By the Middle Ages, Christian traditions in Europe had started to roughly merge these many different mythological figures into one central evil character, though that process wouldn't really be complete until the 1600s when John Milton wrote Paradise Lost. If you recall our episode on the Cathars, the medieval Catholic Church and the Cathars mutually regarded each other as devil worshippers, a label they both associated with every evil thing they could think of. The Cathars were accused of sodomy, human sacrifice, and cannibalism in spite of being celibate, pacifists, and vegetarians. The image of the devil and those who worshipped him, though, continued to loom as the ultimate boogeyman in European and later American Christian thought. Accusations of Satanism became fairly common as time went on, in spite of a complete lack of evidence of Satanists ever actually existing. The Knights Templar, for example, were brutally purged in France in the early 1300s amidst accusations of devil worship, although this turned out to be a very flimsy excuse used by King Philip IV of France, who just owed them massive amounts of money and needed an excuse to kill them rather than paying it back. The witch trials that took place during and after the Protestant Reformation in Europe likewise involved accusations of devil worship, but in all of these cases, the accused who confessed it um, nearly always did so as the result of torture. Another important group that's often brought up in association with worshipping Satan are the Yazidis, who are a group I'm sure we'll cover in detail in a later episode. Now, calling the Yazidis devil worshippers is very inaccurate and considered deeply offensive, but multiple generations of Western occultists, from uh, Eliphas Levy to Anton LaVey, have enthusiastically done so anyway. The Yazidis have suffered some horrifically violent persecutions uh, throughout history, right up until modern times, at the hands of the Ottoman Empire, Iraq, and more recently ISIS, so you've probably heard of them in that context. So while modern Satanism takes essentially nothing from the actual Yazidi faith, there has been a tendency for Satanists uh, right up until today to make offhanded references to them as fellow Satan worshippers, which is problematic to say the least. While well, there's no real historic link between these various groups beyond the outlandish accusations leveled against them by their persecutors, authors, artists, and occultists in Western Europe in the mid to late 1800s started the process of re-examining some of that history with various mystical or humanist outlooks, while others began using satanic imagery purely for these subversive artistic themes. 
Groups like the Hellfire Clubs would also have an influence on what was to come, but those were not religious in nature, consisting rather of exclusive, debauched, and highly sexualized parties in which Christian religion was often mocked. Though, as we're going to see, the actual activities of the Church of Satan are going to end up looking a lot like these sorts of parties from the late 1800s. It was French author and utopian socialist Elias Levy in particular who would be the one who started coming up with ideas of secret magical traditions that he alleged were practiced by the ancient Knights Templar, inventing in the process the goat-headed image of the character Baphomet in 1856, who like so many others would eventually become merged with the central character of Satan. English poet and author Aleister Crowley would be the next major figure to use this imagery in the creation of his religion, Thelema, in the early 1900s, which we'll absolutely be covering in more detail in a later episode. While the magical and occult writings of Aleister Crowley, Eliphas Levy, and others would be borrowed from, adapted, and incorporated into the rituals and imagery of Levian Satanism, the actual religious beliefs that become central to the Church of Satan would come from some entirely unrelated sources. So we just ran really briefly through the history of Satanism before Anton LaVey, such as it was. It's a long list of myths, artistic license, and outright lies. Interestingly enough, most of what's written about the early life of Anton LaVey is itself a long list of myths, artistic license, and outright lies. A few things we know for sure about Anton LaVey are that he was a master showman who absolutely loved being the center of attention. Like many religious leaders we cover in this podcast, he did not go by his original name and was born as Howard Stanton LaVey in 1930. He grew up in a pretty normal middle-class family in Central California, and as a teenager, he spent a lot of time studying music and learning to play the calliope. He claims he ran away from home during high school and used his musical talents to get a job at a traveling circus and later a carnival, also working as a uh, lion tamer. As with most anecdotes he tells about his early life, there's basically no evidence at all that any of this actually happened. But he definitely was a musician and a calliope player, uh, which is a skill that doesn't really have much use outside of carnivals. For the rest of his life, he would display a great deal of, believe it or not, big top style showmanship, as well as an eagerness to swindle cash from the gullible. And his activities with the Church of Satan would often have a very carnival style atmosphere. So regardless of if little Howard LeVay was actually a scrappy teenage carny runaway or not, it's still a part of the myth of who Anton LeVay was, and it's a story he stuck to for quite a long time. Um, but the stories about him being a lion tamer are almost certainly not true. It's during his time at the carnival that he claims his deep contempt for Christianity began to develop, and in the introduction to the Satanic Bible, he describes the origins of his contempt. Quote, on Saturday night, I would see men lusting after half-naked girls dancing at the carnival. And on Sunday, when I was playing organ for tent show evangelists at the other end of the carnival lot, I would see these same men sitting in the pews with their wives and children, asking God to forgive them and purge them of carnal desires. And the next Saturday, they'd be back at the carnival or some other place of indulgence. I knew then that the Christian church thrives on hypocrisy and and that man's carnal nature will out no matter how much it is purged or scoured by any white light religion, end quote. After leaving the carnival, or whatever it was he was actually doing, he claims he began continuing on as a musician, working at various nightclubs around San Francisco, and he claimed at one point to have had an affair with then-unknown Marilyn Monroe, although this is absolutely false and it's pretty obvious they never met. He also began reading the works of Aleister Crowley and married his first wife, Carol Lansing, with whom he would have a daughter, Carla LaVey, who would eventually succeed her father and become high priestess of the Church of Satan, as well as a fixture in the news media and talk show circuit during the Satanic Panic in the 1990s. Anton LaVey also claims that around this time, he worked for the San Francisco Police Department as a psychic investigator. Again, a claim for which there's no proof whatsoever and which San Francisco Police Department has thoroughly denied. One thing he apparently was, in fact, up to in the late 1950s and early 1960s was meeting some Thelemite followers of Aleister Crowley, who disappointed him by being too focused on mysticism and not enough on carnality. LeVay also moved as a, as a musician in social circles that included writers of weird tales, an amazing pulp horror magazine. 
Among the weird fiction writers he claimed to meet and befriend were Clark Ashton Smith, August Derleth, and Fritz Lieber Jr., who in their younger days had all been friends or protégés of H.P. Lovecraft. Just as an aside, if you're into horror, science fiction, or fantasy, check these authors out because they're all amazing. A Bit of the Dark World by Fritz Lieber Jr. is one of my favorite horror short stories of all time, although it's more a story about horror than a horror story. And interestingly enough, August Derleth, in addition to being basically the uh, man who took the reins of the Cthulhu mythos after Lovecraft died, he's the one who helped publish a lot of the unpublished works that Lovecraft really didn't want out there. Um, mm-hmm. He's also a regional writer. He, he, there are a lot of novels just about his time in Wisconsin, which is just a real interesting dichotomy. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time on them, but yeah, I could I could talk about these authors for a long time. They're, I'm a huge fan of all of them. <laughs> so the part about LeVay associating with these writers uh, seems to be the most likely part of his story to be true, since there are actually photographs of some of them together. Although, as we saw in the Um Shinrikyo episode, it's certainly possible to just get a photograph of someone famous and then use it to bolster your own credentials, as um, Choko Asahara did with the Dalai Lama. It is in this occult-minded, horror and weird fiction artist crowd that LeVay founded the Order of the Trapezoid, which would quickly evolve into the Church of Satan. During this time, LeVay divorced his wife in order to begin a relationship with his long-term partner, Diane Hegarty, with whom he would have another daughter, Zena, who today is a Berlin-based artist and spiritual leader of a group known as the Sethian Liberation Movement. Hegarty would also be instrumental in the foundation of the Church of Satan and would be heavily involved with many of the projects for which LeVay is best known. It was April 30th, 1966, that LeVay announced the creation of the Church of Satan, the first officially Satanist religion ever. Uh, It was also at this time he shaved his head, creating his iconic look, in which he later claimed was a ritualistic attempt to appear like an ancient executioner. And at some points, he also falsely claimed it was traditional for Yazidi religious leaders. According to family members, however, he actually shaved his head because he lost a bet and made those stories up later because they fit better with the image he was trying to cultivate. Nonetheless, he would stick with the shaved head, goatee, and pointy eyebrows look that would eventually become to be the image of the stereotypical Satanist. As was presumably his plan, his open embrace of the satanic imagery quickly began to attract considerable media attention, proving his publicity-seeking instincts to be spot on. Soon after the founding of the Church of Satan, the film Rosemary's Baby premiered to spectacular, popular, and critical acclaim. The plot of Rosemary's Baby revolves around a coven of satanic witches, and LeVay would claim he worked on it as a technical advisor, a claim which you guessed it, is completely untrue. Uh, The film did, however, result in a massive upsurge of public interest in Satan and the occult, and within a year, LeVay had jumped on that opportunity to spread his ideology and make a ton of cash by writing his best-known and most influential book, The Satanic Bible. The Satanic Bibles were the actual beliefs of Satanism were laid out, and it became a sort of central text for the Church of Satan, although his followers never regarded it with a sort of reverence or authority associated with the holy texts of many other faiths. The Satanic Bible is divided into four books, the Book of Satan, the Book of Lucifer, the Book of Belial, and the Book of Leviathan. The Book of Satan is short, and it's, no, it's also known as the Infernal Diatribe, in which Lefay rails vehemently against Christianity, claiming in essence that in spite of centuries of slander and insults from what he calls, quote, pulpit pounders, the devil has, quote, remained the gentleman at all times. After centuries of being shouted at, LeVay claims it's time for the devil to shout back. Of the infernal diatribe, LeVay writes, quote, Each verse is an inferno, each word a tongue of fire, the flames of hell burn fiercely, and purify, read on and learn the law. What follows introduces one of the defining characteristics of Levian Satanism as compared to later splinter groups, namely the fact that it is an atheistic religion. While the deep-seated resentment and opposition to Christianity, indeed all other religions, is a central tenet of the Church of Satan, Satan himself, being viewed as a creation of Christianity, is explicitly just a symbol of their beliefs and not something a Satanist is supposed to believe in. The Book of Satan continues on to express the beliefs that human beings are simply animals and advocates an individualistic, social Darwinist lifestyle. 
This section of the Satanic Bible often brings LeVay accusations of plagiarism, as large portions of it are drawn from, from an obscure earlier work entitled Might is Right, written by someone using the pen name of Ragnar Redbeard in 1890. Though LeVay edited out Ragnar's extreme racist and anti-Semitic views, and edited heavily to align with satanic themes inherited from Aleister Crowley. Also featuring very heavily were ideas from Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism, with the ultimate goal of a Levian Satanist being the pursuit of rational self-interest. Though LeVay expands on this into a hedonistic direction with a specific focus on sex. The Satanic Bible also includes the most influential instructions of two Satanists, which are known as the Nine Satanic Statements. 1. Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. 2. Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. 3. Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. 4. Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. 5. Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. 6. Satan represents responsibility to the responsible instead of concern for psychic vampires. 7. Satan represents man as just another animal, sometimes better, more often worse than those that walk on all fours, who, because of his divine spiritual and intellectual development, has become the most vicious animal of all. 8. Satan represents all of the so-called sins, as they all lead to physical, mental, or emotional gratification. 9. Satan has been the best friend the church has ever had, as he has kept it in business all these years. While Satanism is often lumped together with other New Age religions um, that were emerging, especially in California at that point, Lefay and the Church of Satan had a pretty healthy contempt for Wiccans, Neo-Pagans, and people with interests in Buddhism or other Eastern religious traditions. Again, as a staunchly atheist belief system with a focus on improving one's own life in the real world, the Church of Satan explicitly rejected all spirituality. The Satanic Bible also spells out the Satanic view towards children and animals, namely that they are natural Satanists. In LeVay's views, children and, children and animals are impulsive, driven by urges, unencumbered by guilt, lies, and societal structures that he so strongly rejects. His daughter Zena received the first ever satanic baptism, but this ritual is intended to announce and celebrate the fact that she already was a perfect satanist rather than to initiate her into the religion. While adult satanic baptisms involve casting aside religion, quote-unquote, illusions, and what LeVay calls the herd mentality, uh, he views children as already free from these things, and as such, no one is allowed to join the Church of Satan until they have reached the legal age of adulthood. The Church of Satan also heavily emphasizes consent, not just in sex, but in just about any interaction between multiple people, with their lone wolf, individualist philosophy demanding respect for the sovereignty of every other individual. After spelling out Satanist beliefs and rules in the first two books of the Satanic Bible, the second two books focus on magic as a way of achieving self-actualization in the name of Satan rather than as a spiritual or supernatural system, with the rituals being adapted and modified from earlier occult writers such as, again, Aleister Crowley, Eliphas Levy, and John Dee. Like we've seen in other groups like Heaven's Gate and Elm Shinrikyo, the Church of Satan relied heavily on what it alleges to be science for authority rather than any real infernal re revelations, with the focus always being on personal betterment. The Satanic Bible has been heavily criticized for being a self-serving, hastily plagiarized cash grab, though to be fair, creating a self-serving plagiarized cash grab is completely in line with what a believer in its principles should do. What's interesting to us is how much criticism he gets for creating a new religion simply by combining, editing, and expanding on older religious and philosophical traditions, because if people have a problem with that, then uh, well, we've got some bad news about literally every other religion. A uh, frequent satanic counter-argument to the plagiarism accusations are, are to point to the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the Christian Bible, and the long-standing acceptance of the idea that Matthew and Luke were copies of Mark, as well as one other source. Regardless of the controversy, the late 19th century author known by the pen name of Ragnar Redbeard uh, was in no position to offer any legal challenge to LeVay, and the Satanic Bible was a great financial and personal success for LeVay and the Church of Satan. 
Levey proceeded to enjoy the celebrity status that his success had propelled him into, hosting rituals and parties in his black-painted suburban San Francisco home known as the Black House, um, which we should include a... I'm going to include a picture of this in the show notes because it's hilarious. It's literally just like, suburban house, suburban house, black Victorian, <laughs> weird-looking thing. Suburban house, suburban house. Was it out in the suburbs? It's in the su- It's his parents, although he claims he sought out like an old abandoned brothel and like... <laughs> But, no, it's it's his parents' house. Um, and it got torn down, which is a shame, in, like, 2001. Um, the other thing I was on the fence about including there, I found a quote that just had me cracking up in the library. Um, one of his neighbors around this time said uh, about LeVay's black house, quote, I just have a feeling that I can't trust him. There are women there without clothes, naked, and men wearing some kind of black-coated robes. And sometimes from my window, I see red lights and silhouettes like devils. One silhouette, a big one, maybe it's him, standing over the crowd and preaching. Um, and just just the idea that somehow that makes him untrustworthy <laughs> had me laughing so hard. And then, of course, later I found out that that was what he paid a neighbor to say. <laughs> um, so I may or may not include that. So LeVay, being the uh, high priest of Satan, also known in the media as the Black Pope, um, would continue performing various satanic rituals such as marriages, baptisms, and funerals, uh, and would also travel establishing local Satanist organizations known as grottos in in cities like Detroit, which was known as the Babylon Grotto, and New York, which was known as the Lilith Grotto. In the late 60s and 70s, he went from faking connections to celebrities to actually having them, with individuals like Sammy Davis Jr. briefly joining the church, and LeVay uh, would go on to work on various film and television projects with people like John Travolta and William Shatner. Uh, And at this point, he's just uh, loving life and reveling in his success, and has sort of faked his way into the life he pretended he had all the whole time. LeVay and his partner and satanic priestess Diane Haggerty would also continue writing works on Satanism, the most influential of which would be The Satanic Witch, which focused on seduction and sex magic, while simultaneously spelling out the Church of Satan's belief in uh, what were actually really strict traditionally Christian gender roles, as well as, express, as well as expressing an opposition to drug use. The success of the Church of Satan itself was short-lived, however. By the mid-1970s, LeVay found himself in need of money and decided to start charging for membership and advancement within the Church of Satan. While cynical and selfish attempts to gain money and notoriety were always wholeheartedly endorsed by LeVay's Satanist philosophy, this proved to be a step too far for many of his followers. Most notably, the prominent Satanist U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel and PSYOP Specialist uh, Michael Aquino, who took Satanism far more seriously than LeVay ever seemed to. Aquino took many Church of Satan members with him, founding the Temple of Set, uh, which we may cover in a later episode, but probably won't since it's basically just the Church of Satan, but Egyptian-themed and a lot more racist and anti-Semitic due to Aquino's fascination with Nazism. LeVay himself disbanded the church and all affiliated grottos in 1975, with some grottos simply continuing as independent Satanist churches and other others falling apart. He soon changed his mind about the disbanding and continued writing as well as working on music, film, and television projects, with the Church of Satan functioning mainly as a money-making and publicity vehicle. By the 1980s, his daughters had taken over the family business just in time for everything to change with the satanic panic. And that's where we'll pick up the story next episode. But before departing, do we have any concluding thoughts? Oh boy, I got a lot. <laughs> um, one of the things I find sort of most, most amusing and kind of most fascinating is how um, they're essentially identical in philosophy and politics to... Um, really hardcore right-wing evangelical Christians. Um, They're super into strict traditional gender roles. Um, There's a lot of homophobia in both. Very, very strong Ayn Rand influenced, if you're poor, you deserve it. If you're rich, you deserve it philosophy. Apart from the fact that they both completely despise each other, they would get along really, really well. That's that's sort of the the thing that I found that I think is fascinating. And yeah, he's just... It was, I'm sure there are things in here that were inaccurate because, again, he wrote two biographies of himself. Um, 
they were they were essentially autobiographies, but with somebody else's name on it that he had a huge amount of influence over. And in both of them, he tells conflicting stories, neither of which are true at all, that are easily disproven. That you just look at the records and he's referencing working in places that didn't even exist. He's you know, claiming he worked for this organization or that organization, and they're not even organizations. <laughs> it's weird how we've now done two episodes in a row with Discordianism, Discordianism yeah. and now the Church of Satan, where uh, deceit and weaving together of false narratives seems to be such a paramount facet of it. Yeah, and... Um, Chaos magic, I mean, I think that's part of, well, yeah, I didn't even talk about chaos magic as much, but um, that's definitely a, a part of chaos magic is that you live the lie until it becomes reality, essentially, which um, from a chaos magic perspective is exactly what LeVay did, is that, um, yeah, just fake it till you make it was, was essentially all he did. And, um, but yeah, it's not really necessarily a part of Satanism. That's really just LeVay being LeVay like it's um a lot of it isn't so much the church it's just him it's just him making money it's him getting attention for himself um in any way he can now what are the connections if any between uh like LeVay during the early years of the church of Satan and like the music scene because Satanism and satanic imagery become really pivotal for early metal like Oh yeah, right, right with Black Sabbath. Um, he hated it, but profited off it. He was more old school. He he was a musician. That was one of the things that we definitely know for sure about him. He came out with uh, a lot of satanic, um, satanic albums um, of music that he played. But he he very much favored you know um, calliope music, as we mentioned, uh, the sort of creepy carnival music, um, chanting, and you know, that sort of thing. He was not a fan of rock and roll. Um, he thought they were just pretending, um, which they were, and uh, essentially they were much more in the tradition that, drawing from the same traditions that he was drawing from in a lot of ways, of using satanic imagery for the shock value um, just as an artistic thing rather than as any actual religious statement or belief. Um, and that's really what, yeah, like said with him, like Ozzy Osbourne, like he's, it's, it's a character. It's a show. It's it's a entertainment value thing. It's odd though that the sort of standard bearer for early Satanism is opposed to rock and roll, and rock and roll sort of becomes synonymous, at least within the evangelical Christian worldview, as the yeah. music of the devil. And I mean, he while he personally was not a fan in, in interviews and things like that, he would pretend to be. I mean, he he definitely would use any connection that would get him more attention. Um, so yeah, he, he used that to his advantage. And also there were a lot of, uh, especially later with like, um, Marilyn Manson loves LeVay. Uh, I think wrote the introduction to one of the versions of the Satanic Bible when it was reprinted later. Um, so as time went on, um, more in the eighties and nineties, as we'll get into in the Satanic Panic, artists started explicitly drawing from LeVay and Satanism and specifically, um, things from the Satanic Bible. Um, and then it's a whole almost completely unrelated sort of sub note but then there's the the black metal scene in Norway and Sweden um, in which they're very very Satanist oriented and that gets to some pretty dark areas with murders and a huge spate of uh, church burnings but those were theistic Satanists as we'll get into once it all starts splitting up they those are people who believe that Satan is an actual deity that they're legitimately worshiping rather than um, LeVay, who in many ways just comes right out and says it's a symbol. It's, again, for him, it's for the shock value like it is for a lot of these artists, but it's being used for shock value in a religious and philosophical tradition rather than in purely an artistic sense. With the conspiracy theory connection with Discordia, um, LeVay personally hated conspiracy theories. Um, especially later in his life after the satanic panic when he's spent you know 50 years uh on talk shows being like no we don't sacrifice babies for 50 years straight and every single time nobody listens to him um he gets fed up with it towards the end he he gets pretty sick of having to repeat that over and over um and starts to sort of regret them all these uh 
these conspiracy theories have a bigger hold over people's imagination than I thought, and people are taking it way more seriously than uh, he ever was. Um, but again, like with Discordianism, just because they're not taking it seriously doesn't mean that it isn't a legitimate thing, that taking it uh, with a grain of salt is supposed to be part of um, the Satanist belief. You're not supposed to go along with just what people say. You're supposed to be thinking independently um, and not falling into, again, what he constantly rails against is the, the herd mentality. Um, as for conspiracy theories specifically, I think he, he just calls them uh, insane ramblings uh, at one point. But again, he isn't adverse to, to using them again to gain attention and publicity. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the Might is Right, because I think that's actually a publication that uh, Lucian Greaves, who starts the Satanic Temple, that he reads that. Yep, it's... Um, and again, the, the, the big thing about Might is Right is that it's extremely anti-Semitic, um, which with the Kino, he, uh, after leaving the uh, Church of Satan, LeVay has sort of edited all that out, and Aquino goes right back to it. Um, and it's, yeah, those are, those are the Satanists you got to watch out for. LeVay, um, the worst he'll do is convince you to spend money on something stupid. Um, so that's part one of uh, modern Satanism. Uh, thank you for listening, and sorry about the uh, sort of schedule confusion. We're going to try and get these two episodes out in October, and then end October um, with an episode on uh, the spiritualist movement and uh, ghosts and mediums and that sort of thing um, right on Halloween, if all uh, works out as planned. And if you want to keep up with uh, our podcast updates of course you can follow us on social media and if you'd like to help support us we also have a patreon campaign at patreon.com slash sex ed and we also have a donate button right on our website sexed.com for one-time donations we've got a lot of great rewards for anyone who'd like to contribute to us monetarily uh but of course we even appreciate it more if you just leave a rating and review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on and telling a friend or family member about Sex Ed. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albany and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is released under a Creative Commons, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at Leader the Lab for the Education and Advancement in Digital Research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed by Sex Ed do not re necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.